Now, tonight is the January full moon day. It's called the Rutu full moon day in uh, Sinhala, and in Pali it's known as the Pusa full moon day. It's a very important day, again, in Sri Lanka, because they believe that on this day, uh, Lord Buddha visited Sri Lanka for the first time. So I want to tell you tonight uh, some of the legends that are understood in Sri Lanka and uh, believed there, and I'll say something about how these legends can be understood uh, once we've related them. Six years after leaving home, Lord Buddha, at the age of 35, was sat underneath the Bodhi tree and attained awakening. He spent about seven weeks in the same area, really just enjoying the bliss of being an awakened being. And after seven weeks, he traveled over to Benares and to Isipatana, which is where the uh, group of five were waiting for him. There, he converted the group of five, and he later converted Yasa and Yasa's followers. And so by the end of that rains retreat, there were then 60 Arahats uh, in the world, or 61, counting the Buddha himself. And he sent them, as you know, on different, uh, to go on different paths, to go and spread the teaching for the good of uh, uh, gods and men. Then the Buddha himself also went off in a different direction to the way the other monks had gone. And he came back towards Gaia, which is more or less where he had attained awakening. And on the way, he converted the 30 Badawagya uh, uh, young men who were out for a party. They became awakened as well. And then he got to Gaia, and he uh, joined with the thousand matted hair ascetics and was teaching them as well, actually showing a lot of miracles to them uh, uh, because this was one way that they would come round to believe that he was uh, a fully enlightened being. So he did various miracles while he was there. But while he was there, the Kasapa brother wanted to give a big sacrifice. And the Lord Buddha knew that he didn't want uh, the Buddha around while he was giving this sacrifice because uh, the people would follow the Buddha rather than follow you know, the, the person who was giving the sacrifice. So the Lord Buddha went up to uh, Mount Meru, which is now identified with Mount Kailash in Tibet. And from there, while he was looking around the world, he realized that later Sri Lanka would be the one of the main centers for the teaching and that the teaching would flourish there and that it would be a center for the propagation of the teaching. But as he looked at Sri Lanka at that time, it was full of yakas. I don't think any people were supposed to have been in Sri Lanka at that time, but there were many yakas. Yakas are like violent demons, you can say. So the Lord Buddha traveled from Mount Meru, came down to Sri Lanka, and then he showed his power his miraculous power at Myangani. Now, Myangani is one of the main pilgrimage centers in Sri Lanka. If anybody goes to Sri Lanka, that would be one of the centers that they would go to because it's believed that the Lord Buddha went there in the ninth month in the Duratu full moon, which is this full moon, that he went there and... Uh, he went to purify Sri Lanka of the Yakas. And he, dis he called all the Yakas together 
what he did was made a great display of miraculous power, calling up, making it dark, making it stormy, and uh, controlling the elements. And he managed to subdue all the yakas and bring them all under his uh, control, if you like. And then it said that he brought another island called Giridipa. We don't know where Giridipa is. I don't think we want to know where it is either. But he brought Giridipa up to where Sri Lanka was and he put all the yakas onto this island and then he sent the island out into the sea. Now another thing that he did at that time was he, he stroked his hair, not like mine, you see, mine is sh shaven, but the Lord Buddha's hair was not shaven. So he stroked his hair and took some hair and he gave it for relics. And where he uh, performed these miracles and where he took this hair, he gave it actually to Mahasumana, who was uh, one great deva. That deva now lives at Siripada, which is also known as Adam's Peak. So he gave, he gave these relics to Mahasumana, and Mahasumana built the first Chaitya in Sri Lanka. This is nine months after the Lord Buddha had attained awakening. Later, when uh, Lord, after Lord Buddha had uh, passed away, another, a monk called Sarabhu also brought the Buddha's collarbone. And the Buddha's collarbone is also kept in um, the Myangani stupa. So it has two types of relics, the hair relics and the um, collarbone re relics. And later, there was one very famous king in Sri Lanka, Dutagamani. Dutagamani was the king who defeated the Tamils and united the singular uh, race. And Dutagamani extended that stupa from a small stupa to the large stupa that it is now, uh, said to be 80 cubits tall. Now that was the event that took place on this full moon night. But I want to tell you about the Buddha's other visits to Sri Lanka, because we can include it in this talk, but they didn't take part place on this day. But it's also believed, you see, that the Buddha made two more visits. So the second visit was in the fifth year of the Lord Buddha's awakening. And it was actually in the new moon in April. And there were two Nagas. So Nagas are different from Yakas. Yeah. There's a whole kind of uh, uh, cosmology, if you like, of different spiritual, powerful beings called Bhuma Deva, different types of beings that uh, live around the world. Bhuma Deva means gods or devas or powerful beings or spirits, if you like, that are confined to the earth levels. Okay, so these Bhuma Deva, one of them are the Nagas. So uh, there were two Nagas, Mahodara and his nephew Chulodara. It means great odor and um, small odor or little odor. And they were arguing over a jeweled throne in Nagadipa. Nagadipa is the north section of Sri Lanka. So they were arguing and a war was threatening to break out. So the Lord Buddha, understanding that uh, Sri Lanka would later be the home for the Dhamma and for the propagation of the Dhamma, again came to Sri Lanka in order to pacify the uh, Nagas and this great war that was about to begin in Sri Lanka. And uh, it said that Samidhi Sumana, who was a tree spite, sprite, who was living in Jetavana in India, this means it's in Sarvati, Jetavana is one of the main places that the Lord Buddha was teaching. He was a tree spite for a Rajayatana 
tree. It's a particular type of tree. And he pulled up his tree and he followed Lord Buddha and had the tree to act as an umbrella over Lord Buddha uh, on his journey uh, to Sri Lanka and uh, while he was there to protect him from the elements and to, I suppose, in a way, pay homage and reverence to him. So again, the Lord Buddha, when he was in Sri Lanka, by his miraculous power and by his teaching also uh, this time, he was able to pacify the Nagas, and the Nagas uh, didn't, fi didn't fight over this throne, but they gave the throne to Lord Buddha, and the Lord Buddha sat in this throne, taking control of it. Then one of the... Uh, one of the Nagas who had been involved in this fight is called Mani Akika. It means jewel lie. And Mani Akika uh, invited Lord Buddha to come back again to Sri Lanka. So three years later, that's now in the eighth year of the awakening, uh, having been invited by this Naga, then the Lord Buddha with 500 monks uh, came to Kelania. So Kelania, again, is one of these very famous uh, pilgrimage sites in Sri Lanka. Anybody who goes will go to Kelania. And it's because they believe that uh, the Lord Buddha on his third journey with 500 monks came to Kelania. And uh, at that time, the Nagas served him arms and the monks arms. And then the Lord Buddha from Kelania, he made his presence felt in different places in Sri Lanka that would become important. So I think you all know that there's um, a footprint on the top of Siripada. There's a large footprint on the top of Siripada in Sri Lanka, another very famous pilgrimage center. It's also known as Adam's Peak. So the Christians and the Muslims believe that Adam, when he came out of paradise, he stepped down in Sri Lanka and he left his first footprint at the top of this mountain. Okay? The Hindus believe that it was Vishnu who stepped down and left his footprint. Okay. And the Buddhists believe that when the Buddha came in the eighth year of the awakening, he left his footprint on the top of uh, Adam's Peak. So it makes it a very interesting place to go because uh, you get people from all four religions go there on pilgrimage, but they all think it's a different footstep. <laughs> You see, so uh, it's commonly known as Adam's Peak, but in Sri Lanka we know it as Siripada. Siripada means the splendid foot. So this mountain is very high. It's the second highest mountain in Sri Lanka. I've climbed it twice, once in 1993 and once in 2003. You don't start at sea level, you know, you start c kind of quite high up. But still, it takes about five or six hours to get to the top. And you have to go through the night. You can't go through the day because it's too hot to, tr to climb the mountain during the day. So you go during the night. And some of the steps are actually really quite high. If you take that as the base, some of the steps are like this high. And you get like 60, 70-year-old uh Upasikas, it means old ladies, yeah, making this pilgrimage because it's very meritorious to make this pilgrimage and everybody wants to do it, you see. So they, they're making this pilgrimage and these steps are in some places really very high like that and they're kind of going, sadhu, and they make a step. Sadhu, and they make a step. And there's hundreds and thousands of steps to make, you know, but they get to the top. These little old ladies and everything, it's really inspiring, you know. There's really a lot of faith and a lot of um, 
you know, determination and uh, courage involved in it, you know. It's just kind of, some of you fit people wouldn't want to do it, but, um, you know, little old ladies do it, and they get to the top just through their faith, really. It's really a- amazing to see. It's really an experience uh, to be there and to see, to see this happen, you know. And you see them going up and up and up and up and up. And it takes hours and hours and hours, but they get to the top. Okay? So the Lord Buddha left his footprint on the top of Siripada. From there, he went to Anuradhapura. As you know, Anuradhapura, a very important center, because that's where Buddhism was eventually introduced into uh, Sri Lanka. And at the place where they planted the Bodhi tree, he went there. At the place where they made the first Chaitya, he went there. At the, uh, you know, all the main places to do with the religion in Sri Lanka, he went there. And then he came back to India. So this is the third journey, you see, that he made. Now then, I have a very surprising story for you because this story is about the origin of the singular race. So it's said that in uh, what is now Bengal, uh, in northeast India, there was a, a princess who lived there and she was uh, very lusty in mind and she was so lusty uh, chasing after uh, people and so on, that her family disowned her and she was banished out of the kingdom. As she was traveling out of the kingdom in a caravan, yeah, they were attacked by a lion and everybody fled and the lion caught some of the people and ate them up. But the princess went towards the lion and the princess started stroking the lion. And the lion and the princess joined together and then the princess became pregnant. The princess gave birth to two children. One is called Siabahu. That's because he had inherited the characteristics of his father. He had very strong arms and very strong legs. So Bahu means arms. Uh, Sia means uh, lion. So he was called lion's arms, uh, like this. And a daughter called Sia Sivali. Okay, so these were the the offspring of this uh, event where the princess married this lion. Now, the, uh, the son was also not such a good uh, person because the son heard that the, uh, there was money to be had by killing his father because the people were terrified of this lion. So the king had offered 3,000 gold pieces if uh, anybody would kill the uh, lion and bring the body to the king. So the son actually went and killed the father and brought the body to the king. Right? That's one of the bad deeds that he did. He's a patricide. The second bad thing he did is he married his sister. <laughs> okay. So it's an incestuous relationship. Right? So Sia Bahu married Sia Sivali. And they had 32 sons, all twins, 16 sets of twins. And all of them were violent and aggressive because, you see, they're inheriting their uh, grandfather's characteristics. Lions are violent and aggressive, so they'd inherited these characteristics. The eldest of these uh, sons was called uh, Vijaya. And Vijaya also was uh, really violent and really not a very nice person. 
right? So Vijaya was warned by his father to desist from his violence a number of times, but he wouldn't desist. So eventually, his father banished him from the kingdom. And he went over to uh, what is Western uh, India, and he got on board a ship, and he sailed down to Sri Lanka. He landed in Sri Lanka the very day that the Lord Buddha passed into Parinibbana on the, you know, at the end of his teaching career. So the same day that the Lord Buddha attained Nibbana, final Nibbana, Vijaya landed in Sri Lanka. And just before the Buddha attained Nibbana, he told Saka that Vijaya was going to land in Sri Lanka and that Saka, the lord of the gods, must look after him and protect him because later his descendants would inherit the Dhamma and then Lanka would become Dhammadipa. From Lankadipa to Dhammadipa. So Saka appointed Vishnu, who is a Hindu god, okay, he appointed Vishnu to look after Sri Lanka. Now the Sri Lankans to this day believe that the main god looking after Sri Lanka is Vishnu. Yeah. So um, Vijaya, when he arrived in uh, Sri Lanka, there were still some uh, Yakas and Yakanese, Yakanese are female Yakas, so there were still some uh, yak Yakas and Yakanese around, and the, there was one particular Yakani, a female Yakka, if you like, uh, who caught all his men. He had taken 700 men with him, and she managed to entice them, entice all these men, and she uh, captured them, but didn't quite kill them, but she captured them. Okay, and... Vijaya, searching for his men, eventually came across the Yakani and he managed to capture the Yakani and he made the Yakani into his mistress. So Vijaya married the Yakani, which is a demon, if you like. Right? And eventually they had two children. Now those two children are the ancestors of the Aboriginal peoples in Sri Lanka. Okay, so the, in Sri Lanka they're called Vedda. So the Vedda people uh, are the offspring from this um, from this arrangement, if you like, between Vijaya and the Yakani. And then later they founded cities. The 700 men had been released. They founded cities, including Anuradhapura, which was a very important city, of course. And then, very interestingly in the legend, they sent for princesses and wives to be brought from India. But they didn't go to North India, uh, where you might have found Buddhists. Uh, they actually went to Tamil Nadu. Now, ta Tamils and singular peoples have been fighting each other for about uh, two and a half thousand years. So it's very odd in this legend that the women who uh, are supposedly the wives of Vijaya are actually all Tamil. But anyway, this is the legend, so I can only relate what is told in the books. And they brought back uh, many women from the Tamil peoples, it's actually from the Pandu kingdom, uh, to be the wives of these 700 men who had been in exile. And, the, and Prince Vijaya chased off the Yakani, who he was no longer interested in, and married the Tamil princess. Okay. And it's from their offspring that you now get the singular people coming down through the ages over actually now about two and a half thousand years. So, th so these are the stories
behind it. Now from that period onwards, there were various kings that came down and eventually uh, you get to Devanan Pietissa and it's Devanan Pietissa who was on the throne when Mahinda came to Sri Lanka and uh, converted Sri Lanka to Buddhism and later they brought the Bodhi tree as we were explaining last, week, uh, last month and brought uh, s uh, the Arahat Sangamitta who brought the nuns order uh, down as well and Devanan Pietissa was a friend of King Ashoka and so on and so forth and so that's how Buddhism got established in Sri Lanka but they believe that the uh, Lord Buddha himself was there three times during his lifetime. What is happening there is really, you know, there, there is a crisis in Buddhism at the time of the Lord Buddha's Parinibbana because at that time you've got three jewels, yeah? The three jewels, as we all know, are the Buddha and then the Dhamma and the Sangha. Now then, the Sangha carried on after the Lord Buddha had passed away. Yeah? And because the Sangha had carried on, also the Dhamma was still alive. You know, it's still being taught and it's still alive. But where is the Buddha? You see? It creates a crisis in a way in the Sasana because you've got the Sangha and you've got the Dhamma and after the first generation, nobody can remember the Buddha, you know. The Buddha is not present anymore. But something very wonderful in a way happened before the Lord Buddha passed away because he told them to build stupas and to put his relics inside the stupa, you know. Even to this day, there are four main objects that make the Buddha present to us. They are the stupa, yeah, when we worship at the stupa, the relics, when we have the relics like we have in the uh, casket behind us, the Bodhi tree, which was, it's an ancestor of the tree that the Lord Buddha sat underneath, so there's a kind of presence available at the Bodhi tree because of that close association. Yeah. And then the Buddha statue, which reminds you of it. So these are known as the four main, um, the four main objects of veneration in Buddhism. And their function is really to try to make the Buddha present because the Buddha in his body, in his material body, is no longer present. In the Mahayana, if you think about it, later they solved this problem in a different way because they say that the Buddha never, never was born and he never died. He just took the appearance of somebody and became Siddhartha. And at the end he appeared to uh, pass into Parinibbana like this. Right. But the Buddha himself just exists eternally, in eternity, you see, in the Mahayana. That's how they think about it. But it, if you think about it, they're trying to solve the same problem. Uh, how to make the Buddha present when the Buddha has attained Parinibbana. So I think if you look at it from an anthropological point of view, that is what is happening. And then if you go to Burma, the Burmese also believe that the Lord Buddha went to Burma, you know. If you go to Thailand, the Thais can show you the footprints of Lord Buddha left when he went to Thailand. But well, I think what, they, what it's trying to do, you see, is to make the Lord Buddha present. So it's an important thing. That's what we're trying to do uh, all the time when we do Buddha Nusati, you know, this meditation reflecting on the Buddha. We're trying to make the Buddha present to us. Also, when, we're, uh, when we think about the bodhisattvas, what are we trying to do? 
we're trying to make the qualities of the Buddha present. So Kuan Yin or Avalokiteshvara uh, embodies compassion. So that's one of the qualities of the Buddha. Um, Manjushri embodies wisdom like this. So these bodhisattvas have this role of making the qualities of the Buddha present. Yeah. And then you meditate on these kind of semi-bodhisattvas, semi-deities they are, you know, kind of half and half in a way. And then you make those qualities present in your own mind like this. So this is the, um, uh, this is the thing. The, the Durutu full moon actually marks the day when they believe that the Lord Buddha first set foot in Sri Lanka. We, we don't, I think, now believe it historically, you see. But there is a deeper meaning to it in a way that they see a deep connection between their people and the Lord Buddha, that there was some sort of presence of Lord Buddha in Sri Lanka uh, from the very beginning, from the earliest times, like this. And I think this is the uh, meaning that you can see and the kind of uh, uh, meaning that you can take from these legendary stories. So everybody say sadhu.